The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Ahrens Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. Whether it's at work or in the rest of our lives, there are some conversations we just put off, conversations we don't want to have because they're uncomfortable or painful for us or for the person we're talking to. This can get worse, of course, if you have anxiety, or even if you're just an empath and you take in everyone else's feelings. I know for me, the most difficult work conversations are when I'm anxious that I'm not meeting someone else's expectations. Luckily, today's guest has some great advice for how to prepare and get through difficult and awkward conversations. Amy Gallo joins us once again. She's an expert in conflict resolution, a contributing editor at Harvard Business Review, and the author of the book Getting Along, How to Work with Anyone, Even Difficult People. Amy and I started by zooming out, thinking about the power of perspective taking as the first step you can take when you're tackling a difficult person or a difficult conversation. I asked her about one of the most important things we can do first to go into these situations with a clear mind. Letting go of the idea that you know what is appropriate behavior. You have to remember you're seeing a very limited slice of their life and their behavior, and you are seeing it through your lens. And that's, it's very easy to presume that someone has shown up late five times to a meeting because they're disorganized and rude when there's probably something else going on. Totally. And it's so easy when someone is causing you a lot of frustration, tension to say like, this person's a jerk, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Yes. Yes. And that's sort of like a coping mechanism that a lot of us use, right? But it's so much easier to write someone off than to have empathy for them. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's our brain's natural instinct, right? Because we're our brain wants to take shortcuts. So I don't. My brain doesn't want to think about all the reasons that person is being late or sent that email that I think is rude. Or my brain wants to just tell a quick story of they're a jerk. I'm not. That's inappropriate. Right. So really, I mean, it's a sort of a management skill to take the beat and say, "Hang on a sec." Yeah. I mean, it's a life skill, right? I think it's imperative managers do it, but I think we all need to do it. I was talking to someone yesterday who was describing this colleague they're dealing with, and they said, you know, I just don't know why everyone can't be professional. And I I said, oh, gosh, that's such a loaded word. Like, what you mean by professional is going to be very different than what I mean or what someone else means and certainly what someone from a different culture means or from a different background or, you know. Generation. Generation, exactly. And we think we know what is appropriate, allowed, helpful, not helpful, difficult, not difficult. And it's all, you know, in the eye of the beholder. So I want to get your advice because, of course, there's also a mental health lens here, right? Because I think it's fair to say that very few of us are at our best at this particular <laughs> moment in time. Mm, yep. um, so I'm going to posit a scenario to you and you're going to help us like sure. think about taking perspective and taking that beat, right? What do you do if a colleague is like super micromanaging you, right? Mm. Is like emailing you late at night, is always kind of in your face with their expectations of you, mm. which is also produces a visceral reaction in a lot of us. Right. So, okay, a couple of things. <laughs> the one, we first immediately have that reaction, right, of that's not fair, that's inappropriate, why are they doing that, they don't trust me, right? The whole story you might tell yourself about why they're doing that. Usually, that story portrays you as the innocent victim or even the hero and them as a villain. 
And so the first step is to say, okay, wait, what's really going on here? And I don't mean you're actually going to know what's really going on because you don't know what's going on with that person. To our point earlier about perspective taking, you won't actually be able to occupy their brain and say, oh, I get it, or to diagnose them, right? That person might be struggling with anxiety. They might be under a ton of pressure from their boss to get this project done that you're working on. That's why they're micromanaging. It may be that their first job was working for a micromanager, and that's what they think managing means, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many reasons. So you won't ever know, but by asking yourself, okay, what could be going on here? And coming up with several options, right? There, It could be that they're struggling with anxiety. It could be that they think this is the best, most appropriate way to lead a team. You know, it could be. And the, the idea is to unhook yourself from the negative story you've likely told yourself the first time around. And to be fair, some people tell the story, the story they tell themselves is actually self-focused and and self-critical. So rather than, oh, that person's a jerk, they might say, oh, gosh, I deserve to be micromanaged. I, I, right. So there's that story too. Whichever story you're initially telling yourself, come up with some alternative explanations to help loosen your grip on that negative story and remind yourself there could be many other things happening here. Yeah. And that will give you a little bit of the emotional distance you need. And and I wouldn't say emotional distance. I don't want to say you're suppressing emotions, right? But emotional distance in that you can be a little bit more neutral about what's going on and say, okay, but what's the real issue here, right? Is it that I don't want to receive emails after 10 p.m.? Is it that I want them to trust me that I can actually do this without them looking over my shoulder? Like, what is it you actually want? What's your goal in that interaction? Then you can focus on that behavior rather than deciding my, you know, my boss has an anxiety disorder that needs to be addressed, right? That's (laughs) that's not helpful. How are you going to help with that, right? Or they're a micromanaging jerk who can never change their ways, right? So instead of that sort of personality that you're trying to redeem or change, you're focused on the specific behavior that's causing you problems. Because you you can only control what you can control, which is your reaction to their behavior. That's right. As far as I know, it's still not appropriate or probably legal to hand out prescriptions for therapy to your colleagues. (laughs) And so you definitely don't want to get in the business of, wow, you need to really work on this. Um, (laughs) Instead, you, you know, want to think about, okay, what do I actually need from this relationship? What would make this dynamic better? And very practical things, not, well, if they, you know, change their entire personality, right? That's not going to happen. But you can make requests about what you would like to happen in a gentle, compassionate way. Mm -hmm. There's so much in this, but I want to pull out the idea of emotional distance and unhooking yourself because unhooking yourself is such a really powerful it's it's a great visual right mm-hmm. I, I i like unhooking i like defanging which is another acceptance and commitment therapy term so you like take the teeth out of it but the idea that you can unhook yourself from this back and forth this dynamic right cuz everyone we're in relationship with we have a dynamic with mm-hmm. you can literally unhook yourself and just be like okay Yeah. The way you said it, actually, I could literally feel my shoulders drop. Like I was like, (laughs) oh, that's so calming. It is so. But I do want to acknowledge it's a little bit easier said than done. A hundred percent. Right. Like I tell the story in the book about this email I got from a colleague that was just, it was someone I didn't even really know. It was essentially a stranger, but it was so rude. It accused me of not caring about human connection, of, of having an ego, right? And it took me days to get over it. And I would say I hooked so strong <laughs> into that that dynamic. And this was someone who I knew I would never interact with again. It wasn't even a relationship I needed to redeem in any way. It was just, it was an interaction that stuck with me. So it took a lot of effort and a lot of 3 a.m. worrying to just tell myself, okay, wait, what's actually going on here? Why am I so upset about this? What about this interaction has pushed my buttons? What do I actually want to do? In my mind, I wanted to, you know, 
post the email on social media and show everyone what a jerk this person was. And I wanted to write an email back saying how rude he was. You know, there were so many unproductive things I wanted to do. But my theory about that, Amy, just to get all pop psychology, and I'm not diagnosing you because I'm not a clinician, but I know you. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that email, when I read it, I thought he tapped in to her values. Yes. And he said, she's not living up to your values because I know you and I know that human connection is a big value to you. Absolutely. And so he got you at your core because he said, life is about human connection. You're ignoring me. Yep. Yep. You're that's not a, about human connection. That's exactly right. Like he was telling me I was the opposite of who I believed myself to be. And that was so upsetting because it was also, I had to ask myself, is he right? That was part of the processing of it. And I think that's one of the things when we do interact with someone who we find difficult or challenging, it makes us question ourselves. And am I the kind of person who doesn't value human connection? Am I the kind of person who deserves to be micromanaged? <laughs> you know, am I the kind of person who raises my voice and makes others feel uncomfortable? Whatever it is, that interaction is often a mirror, which is also why it's hard to unhook often. And so one of the tricks with the unhooking that I really talk about perspective taking, just to bring it back, is that I sometimes try to play the perspective of, of a third party. So mm. if my friend who I consider smart and insightful was looking at this, what would she say about this dynamic, about what's happening? And it just, again, takes down the intensity that takes the fangs out a little bit and just gives me a little bit of space to say, okay, what actually is going on or what could be going on? Because there's at least two perspectives, probably many more on what could be going on here. Yeah. And it's so hard. I mean, you know, even something like an email from a stranger, I think also just in times that are stressful, right? It's much easier to hook into something that feels accusatory, but still not catastrophic, like an email someone sends you. Yes. And you know what you're making me think of more? The email also came in, it was fall 2020, right? I was deprived of human connection <laughs> for so long at that point. It was the context, too, of he, he was making me question who I am, but he was also pointing out something I was really missing. I want to think about your archetypes. You lay out all these different personality types. Mm -hmm. So talk about why you think it's helpful to look at your office interpersonal relationships through archetypes. Like, how does that help us organize and how does it help us gain perspective on our own selves, too? So it's fun. I have very mixed feelings about the archetypes. <laughs> you would think I'm out here talking about this book. You'd think I'd be like, yes, the archetypes are great. But I do have mixed feelings. So let me tell you, first of all, why I organized the book around the archetypes. So there's, there's eight of them. There's the insecure manager, the pessimist, the victim, the passive aggressive peer, the biased coworker, the know-it-all, the tormentor, which is someone who you expect to be a mentor, but actually is torments you <laughs> instead. And then the political operator. So someone who just really focused on their career. And the impetus for choosing to focus on the archetypes was that I was getting a lot of questions from people when I was doing talks and workshops based on my last book about conflict, about specific behaviors in their coworkers that they didn't know how to deal with. And that most mm. of the advice they'd gotten about either dealing, you know, generically with difficult people or resolving conflict just wasn't working. And I knew because of my role at HBR that there was lots of research about these specific patterns of behavior and how to work with people who exhibit them. And I thought, okay, how do I get that advice specifically to the people who need it? So the benefit of the archetypes is that you're by understanding the archetype that most aligns with your colleague or the archetypes, it might be several of them that aligns with your colleague and their behavior, you're able to get specific tactics and advice for that specific situation. And that was really important to me is that I wanted to help people, you know, who are really struggling with something more narrow than this person's a jerk or this person's pushing my buttons, but really who wanted to focus on what exactly was difficult for them and then take some steps to improve it. And I, I will be honest, the archetypes are sort of fun <laughs> too. So that, you know, looking around your office going, hmm, oh, 
okay, there's the there's the know it all right there. That that can be enjoyable. Now there are also huge downsides to the to the <laughs> archetypes if they're used wrong in the incorrect way or without the best intentions. And I think they can be used as dismissive labels. And that's the one thing that I really feel a little uneasy about with the archetypes is that if someone wanted to use them to basically, you know, name call their colleagues of like, well, this one's this and this one's this, and then I don't have to deal with them, right? Like just to use it as a way to be like, I, ugh, you know, right, right. passive aggressive so other care. It, other exactly. It. Like, it's it, all about the other people. Exactly. And I do try in the archetype chapter, so for each one to really explain what might be motivating that behavior, not in a pathological way, but in a logical way. What would actually explain why someone would choose to act in this manner and what's a rational explanation because the reality is this is one of my key messages is who among us hasn't acted like this right who among us hasn't been passive aggressive in the last week right like it's the, these are things we all do at times and so i really wanted to make sure i was clear i've done a lot of these things it's all possible. We might be the difficult person. And so understanding that behavior might help us see ourselves, but then also treat this colleague with a little bit more care, understanding, and, and empathy. Yeah. There's a Yiddish word called rachmonis, which incorporates all of that. But it's also it's also a little bit of sort of, I don't know what you're going through, and I'm going to give you a little bit of grace. Mm. I know. My father would always say it. It just popped into my head. <laughs> But I think what's interesting also is to think about, you know, through the lens of mental health challenges, that people may all of a sudden act differently when yes. they're going through struggle. Yes. And so how can your archetypes be helpful almost in an applied situation where, you know, all of a sudden a coworker who you didn't really have issues with becomes difficult, yeah. becomes passive aggressive? Yeah. I think the best way to use the archetypes is to recognize that these are patterns of behavior. So each, you know, there's common behaviors for each of the archetypes. And to look at your colleague's behavior and try to figure out, okay, which archetype do they fit right now? And again, you can't pigeonhole them, right? No one is always the passive aggressive peer or always the pessimist. You know, it can feel that way because of confirmation bias, but chances are we behave differently at different times. And to your point, someone who might be encountering a mental health issue that they haven't encountered before, their behavior may suddenly change. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the behavior that's causing you trouble, try to align it with one of the archetypes and then find tactics within those chapters about what you do in that situation. In that situation. The other thing I want to ask you about is I know that you have a background and a lot of training in organizational development. And of course, Every organization is a system. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about the lens of the systems that we work in. Is there anything about certain kinds of organizations that almost force us into an archetype, like almost like a family mm -hmm. system, like you have the golden child and you have the clown? Like, because I see this and I, I worked in politics and I always use mm. politics as like it is the perfect circus to explain a lot of human behavior. <laughs> Are there certain kinds of organizations that you might sort of look at suspiciously and be like, they're going to create insecure bosses. They're going to create know-it-alls. They're going to create pessimists or yeah. political operators. There's interesting research. I'm trying to remember who did it. They Oh, it's, yeah, it was Booz and Company, which is now Strategy and someone named Gary Nielsen led the research about the personalities of organizations, including, mm. for example, a passive-aggressive organization. So they really talked about how these organizations create the unproductive or destructive behaviors that we often see. And you certainly see, you know, two things. One, you see the people at the top of the organization really set the tone, right? And then also in terms of the structure, in terms of how work gets done, whether there's a you know, sort of steep hierarchy or more flat organization, whether it's more of a command and control model, all of that will encourage some of this behavior. So let's take passive aggressive behavior, for example. Mm. If it's an organization that is incredibly conflict averse, right, you're not supposed to disagree with others. People are very nice. You know, they, and I put mm -hmm. nice in air quotes, right? <laughs> They're very polite. You know, those are the organizations where basically saying, I don't agree. People hear that as you're an idiot, right? You know, and so 
the only way for people to actually express their true thoughts and feelings is in a passive aggressive way. And so, of course, that's going to encourage that behavior. And that points to the need for leaders and managers to really be thoughtful and careful about how they're structuring meetings, how they are setting norms for their teams or their organization, because you could play a role in nipping a lot of this behavior in the bud. I hate that term, but like of of (laughs) actually stemming this behavior before it happens or as it happens, just making clear, no, we're not going to do that here. We're going to be direct and honest, or we are going to try to achieve, but not at the expense of others. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I think there's also a lens of shame throughout mm. all of this. And and you bring this up in the book. You talk about shaming is really a nuclear weapon, right? Yeah. Like using shame as a cudgel with any kind of personality. It's really damaging. But But I think a lot of us also, we act out because we're afraid of shame. We protect ourselves against this fear of shame, and shame is so prevalent on Mm. teams and in organizations. Yeah, it is amazing. You know, there's this term ego defensiveness that that comes up around a lot of these archetypes. So you're you're actually defending your ego, and therefore you act like a political operator or you're an insecure manager or, you know, any of those, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, come into play. And it is amazing how fragile our egos feel in a work context. And partly because we're performing, we even use that word, right? Performance. And <laughs> so true. It's, which is bizarre when you think about it. But that, the, the idea that your ego would be bruised or damaged or you'd be shamed is a motivator for a lot of our unproductive behaviors. The other way that shame comes into play for me when I think about this book is that, that a lot of people feel shame at not being able to handle it. So a lot of the people I talked to for the book were just embarrassed that they let this person get under their skin or that they didn't know how to address the behavior or that they stayed in the job where they were miserable for too long. And so I think people on both sides of the table here are feeling a lot of shame, which is not a good place from which to try to create a better relationship or change the dynamic because everyone's just... I don't even know if this is a phrase, but like in a shame hole that they can't get out of, you know, (laughs) in a shame hole and also wearing a lot of shame armor. That's right. You know, to sort of protect me. Exactly. But the role of the ego is really interesting because, of course, ego drives a lot of performance. There's Mm -hmm. that word again. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that we have to sort of almost pull out our ego and look at what it wants in order to take perspective on how that insecure boss is affecting us or, or maybe even how we're? being the insecure boss? Like, what is the role of sort of looking at your ego and its investment in your job? Yeah, I think if we all did that on a regular basis, we'd probably be easier to deal with, you know, just (laughs) to understand like, oh, you know what, I am talking over her in this meeting, because I want to be seen as someone who's knowledgeable, right? Instead of, oh, she takes too long to get to her point, so I just have to interrupt, right? We, there's all these ways in which we justify the behavior when truthfully what we're trying to do is demonstrate something good about us, our value, our worth. And I think if we did really examine, okay, what does my job give me? What do I show up on this laptop or in my office where however you show up at work, what does it actually give me? And when I don't get that, how do I feel? And that doesn't mean you have to sort of walk around and tell everyone, oh, I'm here because (laughs) this feeds (laughs) my ego. But that awareness, I think, helps you to go back to the perspective taking. I think it really helps us actually take the perspective that we're all there constantly defending and and protecting our ego. I was getting ready for this interview and I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal and 
the idea of power came into my head mm. because, of course, power is a huge factor in how we trade at work. And this quote is from Jason Oppenheim for any of you who are fans of Selling Sunset on Netflix. <laughs> he's, he's talking about power and he's saying, I've tried to understand power is internal. Power as I understand it now, is refraining from having to respond to someone else. It's the power to control your own emotions. Mm. And so when you don't have to constantly burnish your own ego and protect yourself from feeling shame, mm -hmm. you have power because you are not you're not at the whim of other people's actions, right? right? Like you have that internal power of controlling your own emotions. Yeah. Well, and it's sort of scary, actually. The, the, the power, the way power plays out in a lot of these negative behaviors we observe in others is that they think, for example, being a pessimist, right, is going to give them power. Or they think being a know-it-all is going to give them power. Why, why would being a pessimist give you power in an organization? Oh, there's actually interesting research that we afford cynics much more authority than we do optimists, which is, <laughs> which I think partly because they're being sort of like counterintuitive or they're pointing out all the risks. And somehow that feels like something someone in authority would do. And we tend to see optimists as sort of foolhardy, maybe even Pollyanna-ish. And so that we don't we don't give them the same amount of power or authority we would give to someone who's criticizing. And I think there is some research that shows that pessimists actually articulate that. Like they do feel more powerful when they criticize something or point out all the ways it won't work or which is we all are prey to that. I think it's part of our negativity bias, too, mm -hmm. is that we're just drawn to the negative more so than the positive. Well, and they feel like they have asymmetric information, right? That's if they right. know something's going to fail, they know something you don't. And that's power. That's exactly right. And the know-it-all, too, right, is they're brokering, I have knowledge. The know-it-all is really brokering an overconfidence, which we reward so much in organizations, right? When you can't you know, Tomas Chamorro per music really helped me understand this with his work, which is that when you can't measure something objectively like leadership, right, you can't say this person gets a score of 99 on, on leadership. We allow people to tell us how good they are at that. And so someone who's overconfident, we actually think is a good leader because they've told us they are. It's, it's, <laughs> and so then that's they're again brokering in this power to sort of gain boosts to their ego by exhibiting that power. The real true power, though, to the quote you just shared, is not about putting others down, but it's actually being able to choose how to react and choose how to respond when your ego is involved. Mm -hmm. Because that knee-jerk response of I must defend my ego or I must protect myself or my career is often those behaviors in that moment are things that we don't feel proud of later, can be counterproductive, and also maybe will worsen the dynamic that you're already struggling with. Because, of course, one of your points is if you're serious about resolving conflict, you have to look at yourself, too, right? It takes two to tango. Yes. And that your relationship with your coworker is not something happening to you. It's something that you're participating in. Yep. And it doesn't feel that way. It feels like they're, I'm just sitting here trying to do my job. I'm just, you know, and it feels like they're subjecting you to their negative behavior. But there's almost in all cases some way in which you are feeding the dynamic, not necessarily feeding it in a negative way, but you're actually contributing. And by examining that role, and I use this phrase, you know, cleaning up your side of the street, which I later learned, a friend shared that phrase with me, and she was actually had a teenager who was struggling with a mental health issue and her therapist told her, well, you know, while he's working on himself, you need to be cleaning up your side of the street. So when you show up to that relationship, you're not showing up with all your garbage. And I think that's very true. It's actually a term from AA or Narcotics Anonymous. I think that's one of the most important things you can do. And that's, you know, examining the ego is part of that, mm -hmm. cleaning up your side of the street. But just being clear with yourself, what am I doing here? What could I do differently? What would be a sort of more controlled or, or healthier way to show up in this dynamic? And if I did that, would it nudge that person into more productive behavior? I also think it's true 
the kind of personality that's going to trigger me is not the kind of personality that's going to trigger you. Right. Yeah. Like I'm really comfortable with know-it-alls and pessimists for, because I'm sort of am one. And, you know, as an, <laughs> I, I, I can just see them. I can see their insecurity. But when I'm dealing with an insecure boss who mm. then tortures me, I'm toast. Yeah. Well, and a lot of people struggle. I wonder, is it the power dynamic or is it the insecurity or is it both for you? I mean, I'm very insecure. Mm, mm. <laughs> I probably am the insecure boss so that when I'm dealing with someone who is acting out their insecurity, I just assume it's me. I would never assume it's the other person. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you're describing, and I think I have this experience too, you're describing when someone's similar to you, like the pessimist, you get them. But then you're also describing, well, when someone's similar to you in that insecurity, it's really hard for you. I think that's true for me, too. Like, I identify as a know-it-all, and I I can deal with know-it-alls. You do. That's really interesting. I do. I do. I do have this tendency to proclaim things <laughs> that I don't really actually know <laughs> for sure. And I think it's more in my personal life. And I really see it as the downside of it is I see how I silence people with mm -hmm. my certainty sometimes. And that's mm -hmm. I just don't leave room a lot of time for an open discussion. I'm not proud of it, but I have to recognize it. Oh, that's super interesting. Can I tell you how relieved I am that you don't, you weren't like, yep, you're a know-it-all. Like it is, like, I'm like, oh good, I hit it from more. She didn't see it. I see know-it-all behavior. I'm like, oh, I know how to deal with this. You know, I, I can come right up to it and take a close look at it in the face. But then there are other behaviors like passive aggressive is the one I really struggle with. Mm. And I do, of course, behave passive aggressively. Sometimes I think we all do. But for me, it's just the, you know, Annie McKee, expert in emotional intelligence, calls it shadow boxing. And that to me is so hard, right? You just can't land. It's like, I want to have, I want something for us to latch on to, to actually discuss or, or solve together. And you're just, you know, diving left and right. So I can't actually connect with you. And that's really hard for me. Finally, you know, I have a lot of listeners who identify as neurodiverse, mm -hmm. as do I. And, and I think when you're neurodiverse, whether you're on the spectrum or you have ADHD or you have a mental illness, like sometimes you miss stuff, mm -hmm. right? And I'm curious, like, I feel like your archetypes might be extremely helpful in that case. Have you come across that as you've been promoting the book? And do you have any applied ways that someone who sort of maybe sometimes struggles to interpret humans on that deeper level might use these archetypes? Yeah. You know, what you just said, I hadn't had actually hadn't occurred to me that if you're someone who has trouble reading other people, actually the list of common behaviors might help you understand a little bit, oh, that's what they're doing, right? Is that I can see that. I actually did do a talk and someone in the audience was asking about a colleague and they started describing their behavior as being sort of abrasive and um, rude and very blunt. And the discussion in the room evolved to the point where people started being clear about who they had interpreted that person to be. And, you know, some people said, oh, I think it's someone who is probably neurodivergent. I think it's someone who's from a different culture. Right? We all sort of started presuming who this person was through our own lens based on very little behavior. And it was such a good encapsulation of what we do every day is that we see people do, you know, two, three, four things, or we spend an hour with them. And then we just make all these assumptions about them. And I think one of the things that I see happen over and over is that neurodivergent folks get really late slapped with this difficult person label. Yeah. And time. I think the, the archetypes can be helpful for folks who are working with neurodivergent people to say, oh, wait, these are the behaviors that are bothering me. This isn't a personality issue. This is just the behaviors they exhibit. And there might be very good reason why they do that, right? They might not be reading the room. They might not be able to understand how their words are impacting you. And that hopefully will give people on both sides a little bit more empathy in terms of how to both interpret the behavior and how to address it so that we're not pigeonholing people who aren't the same as us. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the big takeaways is that we are not our behavior always. Mm. And actually, most of us aren't our behavior. But also most of us sort of behave reflexively and habitually. And we have to look at that too, you know? Yes. yes. I love that. You know, I hadn't thought about that 
actually as a theme of the book, but we aren't our behavior and we are also accountable for our behavior. Yes. And I think that's that's not always easy to rectify. And yet I think that's really what we have to keep in mind when we're navigating these challenging relationships at work. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the Anxious Achiever world. Thanks for listening. 